let's take a look at Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. The idea of a kinsman redeemer is found in Leviticus 25. It's actually found in several places in Leviticus 25, but I just picked out verse 25 and 26. It says, If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it. Now I just cut off the last part of the verse there, I realize. Uh, anyway, the whole idea of it is um, your nearest relative has the opportunity to come and redeem your property, uh, you know, things of that nature. And so a kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws of the Pentateuch, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who is in trouble, danger, or need. The Hebrew term goel for kinsman redeemer designates one who delivers or rescues. I've got several verses here, Genesis 48, 16, Exodus 6, 6 or redeems property or person. Leviticus 27, 9 through 25, chapter 25, verse 47 through 55. The kinsman who redeems or vindicates a relative is illustrated most clearly in the book of Ruth where the kinsman redeemer is Boaz. So uh, Ruth 3, verses 1 through 8. And we're kind of jumping into the middle of Ruth here, but uh, this kind of gives an interesting picture. It says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with those young women you were? With whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the fl threshing floor. Watch therefore and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. That would be startling to me. <laughs> I, you know, I looked and tried to see if there was some kind of significance to that. I couldn't find something, uh, you know, concrete. Right. Yeah. All right. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Uh, most people that I read seem to think that the reason for uncovering his feet is so that he would feel her as she, you know, laid down at his feet. The whole purpose was to get his attention. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, it would, it would freak me out, that's, that's for sure. Uh, it would startle me. So the narrative at the center of the book of Ruth depicts the scheming of Naomi and Ruth to attract the, the attention of Boaz. Um, I kind of didn't like using that word scheming, but I didn't really know what else to, to call it. Um, that's really kind of what they were doing. The rest of the story and history hinges on Boaz's response to their efforts. What will it be? Will he prove himself a kinsman redeemer and redeem those needy women? Will he portray righteousness and Christ-likeness? And as the story unfolds, Ruth follows her mother-in-law's advice, and after perfuming and adorning herself with fine clothing, she hides herself in Boaz's threshing house until he has feasted and drunk. Then, once he has fallen asleep, Ruth positions herself at Boaz's feet and waits for him to notice her. Startled, Boaz awakens and immediately questions Ruth's identity. 
Ruth replies with her identity and directly announces her mission. She proposes marriage to Boaz by requesting that he fulfill his role as kinsman redeemer. Talk about a very forward woman. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I'm going to get myself in fine clothes and I'm going to perfume myself and I am going to uncover your feet and lay at your feet while you are drunk. (laughs) And when you wake up startled, I am going to declare that you are my Redeemer and you are supposed to marry me. Uh, Wow. So, uh, the role of kinsman Redeemer is found in Leviticus 25. In the case of an Israelite man's death in which he fails to leave behind a son, the brother of the deceased man is commanded to take his widow's wife and both redeem the land and provide a son to carry on the deceased father's name. So the requirements of the kinsman redeemer, there are three requirements. It's to be a near relative or kinsman. It's to be one who had the means to bring about the redemption. Okay, that's important. Doesn't matter if you uh, are a relative, if you are not able to redeem your relative. And the third one, you had to have the desire to accomplish the redemption. Okay, uh, and you can see, uh, I don't remember if I've actually got it in here or not, but Boaz, one of Boaz's concern is, he says, I am indeed a kinsman redeemer, but there is another redeemer closer than me. So uh, the whole point was there was actually someone closer in the family line than Boaz, and Boaz had to wait and see what this one closer in line would do. But so all of these three had to be Uh, fulfilled in order to be a kinsman redeemer. A near relative, one who had the means to bring about the redemption, and one who had the desire to accomplish the redemption. And this is Boaz's alleged position as indicated by Naomi in Ruth 2.20. And it is this responsibility that Ruth pleads with Boaz to fulfill. Being the godly man that he is, Boaz graciously receives Ruth's offer, but communicates that he is not the nearest kinsman redeemer. However, he promises that as soon as morning breaks, he will look into the situation. Additionally, he supplies Ruth with six measures of barley, and through a series of events, the door opens for Boaz to fulfill his position as kinsman redeemer. Now that's... uh, I always just thought the whole idea of a kinsman redeemer was odd. I cannot imagine marrying my brother's wife if he passed away. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a strange thing. And I look at it, and I'm like, yeah, like that's kind of weird, but there was purpose and meaning. <coughs> even behind this, right? Nothing that God sets in Scripture is there by accident. And we might view it as weird, but there's purpose to it. There's meaning behind it. Every single thing, there is a meaning behind. And same with this. You know, a brother taking a wife and even giving the wife a child in order to carry on the bloodline, you know, that's that's kind of a bizarre thing But, again, there's meaning behind all of this. And the fact that Boaz is so willing to do this, and even cares enough about her, you know, she has just invaded his personal space and his personal privacy in a big way. Right? If it was me and I woke up with a strange woman curled around my feet, Get out of here. (laughs) Who are you? Get out of my house. Why are you here? But Boaz very graciously says, you know what, I am your redeemer. And and that should have been enough. But Boaz even says, no, actually, uh, you can't even leave here empty handed. You know, I'm going to give you some barley that you can take 
back with you while I figure out this whole kinsman redeemer situation. Uh, the kindness of Boaz is incredible there. Absolutely incredible. He was under no obligation to do this. The other redeemer who was nearer chose not to. You know, we see that later. But yet Boaz is here and he is willing to do this. You know, what kind of love do you have to have in order to uh, do something like that for essentially a stranger? You know, wow. What if the deceased man's brother was already married? Would you be expected to take a second one? <laughs> um... Yeah, you know, I don't actually know the answer to that question. How many wives did they have back then? You know, that's what I started to say. Why is it that the Lord commands it to be husband of one wife? And I believe He even did in the Old Testament, didn't He? Oh, yeah. So why did they take it upon themselves to think that a man could go get a wife? I don't know. I believe it. Why didn't you know your brother's wife, your sister's wife? Just, you know, that's what I was thinking. If that, if that was his brother's wife, right? Well, <laughs> apparently it was it was a little bit further along the line than than just a brother. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, yeah, they, they were related in some way. Um, I'm realizing I should have spent more than eight hours on this. <laughs> Right, yeah. So it could have been even on down to a cousin right. or something. Yeah. Oh. So the Bible uses this word, and we actually heard this taught, I guess, a few Sundays back on C in CR. Uh, we had a, someone come and talk about the Hased of God. And it's compassionate, loving kindness. And so with the greatest hased, Boaz rises to the task of becoming kinsman redeemer. And it's worth noting Ruth's position in the Hebrew Bible. And this is just something that I found interesting. So Ruth is placed directly succeeding Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs illustrates the wisdom of a righteous man and it concludes with chapter 1, the description of the virtuous woman. And ironically, Boaz is wisdom personified. He is a wise man who acts with respect and dignity even in the most tempting situation. And interestingly, Ruth, a Moabitess, is personified as the godly woman. In fact, the very language used to describe the Proverbs 31 woman of character whose works praise her in the gates, that's Proverbs 31.31, 31, is used regarding Ruth in 3.11, which literally reads, All the gate of my people knows that you are a woman of worth. It is as if the compilers of the Hebrew Bible place the book of Ruth directly after Proverbs to describe the marriage between the wise man and the virtuous woman. That's just something interesting that I, you know, I just kind of thought about. But so Boaz foreshadows Jesus Christ, the ultimate kinsman redeemer who will redeem a bride for himself, which is the church. The story of Ruth portrays God's blessing on the righteous. This outcome was only accomplished, though, through Boaz's righteous response. We have to understand that. If Boaz had not chosen to be the Redeemer, well, Ruth would have been left out in the cold. You know, it, it was ultimately up to Boaz. He had to accept this role as kinsman Redeemer. Through his actions, Boaz communicates Christ. 
His person and character illustrate the incredible said, the loving kindness that Christ possesses for His people, as well as the great measures He is willing to take to redeem His bride. Though Ruth arrives at Boaz's bed empty-handed and humbled to the core, Boaz treats her with respect and kindness. Notice again, Ruth, by the way, is a Moab. She is a foreigner. She's not a Jew. That's another reason why Boaz could have just kicked her out. And yet, this Moabite woman <laughs> found favor in the eyes of a Jew. Boaz treats her with respect and kindness. Disgraced by her position and despised for her ethnicity, the young Moabite woman appears to have little to offer. Yet despite all this, Boaz views her as a worthy woman. And though Ruth comes from a family that has turned their backs on the Lord, the Lord turns His face towards Ruth and reveals Himself to her through Boaz. Boaz foreshadows Jesus Christ, the ultimate kinsman redeemer who will redeem a bride for himself, the church. And as a redeemer, Boaz not only takes Ruth as a wife, but he also fulfills the Levitical law by producing a son to carry on Elimelech's family line. We see Ruth's need fulfilled in Ruth 14, which reads, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. But this wasn't merely a son. This was a special son who would preserve the royal line from, from which not only the great King David would descend through, but most importantly through whom would descend the greatest king, King Jesus. And though Boaz redeemed the line of Elimelech, Jesus would come to redeem all the people of God. It was him to whom Boaz's position pointed to, for in the person and work of Christ was found the true definition of kinsman redeemer. I just love how God <laughs> works these situations out. Right, If Boaz had not been a godly, wise man, if he had not been a righteous man, uh, there would have been no King David, and there would have not even have been a Jesus. And you can find all throughout Scripture, there's these weird things that God does, and He uses people that we would look at and go, wow, why would God use them? Why would God use a Moabite woman to go and pursue after a Jewish man and then take that Moabite woman and make her of the lineage of Jesus? Wow. Wow. Uh, and, and you find this several times in Scripture where it seems to be the most... Uh, we would call them the lowliest of people. Even David was the lowliest of his brothers. <laughs> he was the very last one. Imagine... The priest comes to your house and says, Hey, the Lord says that the next king of Israel is going to be here. Imagine that you are the father of this household. You go, oh, all right. And so you bring out your oldest son. Surely it's going to be him. Nope, not him. Are you, are you sure? Because he's tall and he's handsome. And, and even Samuel looked and was caught off guard by the appearance. He's like, oh, surely that has to be the next king because look how, look how handsome he is. Look how mighty of a warrior he is. And God says, nah, quit looking at the outward. <laughs> I see the inward. I see the heart. 
And so they progress through this long line of brothers. And God says, no, it's none of them. Samuel said, hey, <laughs> and that dad is like, oh, you know what? I actually, I got that small little ruddy boy watching after the sheep. <laughs> the lowliest of them all. And God says, yep, that's him. That's the one I want. Her name escapes me. The one, the prostitute on the walls of Jericho. What was her name? Rahab. Rahab. Yeah, Rahab the harlot. She is also uh, yeah. one of the ones that is in the lineage of Jesus. Without Rahab the harlot. Right. I, I hate even referring to her as the harlot. We, we do that a lot. We define people by things that they have done. Just like blind Bartimaeus. He's still known as blind, and yet he's not blind anymore. <laughs> but everybody just says blind Bartimaeus. You know, everybody just says Rahab the harlot. And... So God uses these people because He sees something in them that man doesn't see. And it's the same way with us, right? It's the same way with us. Uh, I love the fact that Jesus cares so much about us that He fulfilled that role of kinsman redeemer. By the way, if you want to know why Jesus had to become a man in order to redeem us, well, that was one of the requirements of kinsman redeemer. Had to be someone in the family. Well, God isn't in the family of humanity. God is way out here, way above us. And so God became man so that He could redeem man. Jesus was willing to do it as well, which is an absolutely amazing thing. And He had the means to obtain redemption for us as well. So all of those things put together meant that Jesus really was the only one who could redeem us from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, we were dead in sin, and there was not a single person in humanity who could have redeemed all of humanity. Not a single one. The very best that humanity had to offer failed, and they failed miserably. From King David, who was a man that God said, this is a man who's after my own heart. That man failed horrifically. And this is just, you know, just an aside, but I always find it funny when people say that the Bible's made up, like it's been altered, it's fictitious, it's made up. Why in the world, if I was going to invent some Bible heroes, not a one of them in Scripture would be who I would invent. I would not invent a man who looked at a woman and saw her bathing, used his position as king to bring her to him, sleep with her, get her pregnant, and then conspire to kill her husband. That is not a man that I would invent as a Bible hero. <laughs> you know, Samson, strongest man to ever live, and yet he was infatuated with Delilah. And he was sinning every time he went and laid his head on her lap. Why in the world would, would my hero, that if I'm going to make one up, why in the world would I make one up 
that is found in sin. Abraham, well, he's the father of faith. He was also a coward <laughs> who claimed that his wife was actually his sister because he was too scared to fight for her. He was also, even though he's the father of the faith, he didn't have any faith. <laughs> God said, out of you, I'm going to bring an heir and, and your, the numbers of, of your offspring are going to be like the stars in the sky. And Abraham goes, okay, Lord, I think I'll sleep with my wife's servant. Yeah. <laughs> what a bizarre thing. Why in the world would we think that these are made up people? Why? Why? <laughs> Just yep. like with Samson, you know, yep. his strength came back. You know, the spirit came back. It had left him. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so, because they repented. Just the same way with us. Mm. With all of us. Yeah. But Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Uh, you can't actually find a whole lot of instances in Scripture of a kinsman redeemer. Uh, you have, of course, this with Ruth and Boaz. But aside from that, the only other example that I can think of is when the Pharisees are talking with Jesus and says something to the effect of uh, they're trying to trap him and you know they kind of make mention of well, you know, if a woman's husband dies, the brother is supposed to take her as, as his wife. But aside from that, I can't really think of another instance of a kinsman redeemer, although I'm sure that there were many instances. There was so much war and death and destruction in that time I'm sure that this happened very often. But I do find it interesting that the, the main story that we have is uh, you know, one that eventually leads down the path straight to Jesus. You know, I don't think that that's by accident. Uh, any questions? said that there's a man that's done these things, he's took this man's mm -hmm. wife, you know, you know, right to David. Uh, the prophet said, and David said, where is this man? Bring him to me. Mm -hmm. Did he, was David so, I don't know, was he so in his conscience seared or something, just maybe because of who he was, that he didn't even realize... I mean, he had to know what he was doing. But did he not really even see that that was him? Yeah. I mean, can we get to the place where we can justify something in our own mind to the point? Like when the prophet explained that to him, David just got mad and said, Who is that man? Bring him to me. He was going to kill him. or what? And it was him. Yeah. So I, I just always wondered, I mean, had David went so far that that he wasn't even realizing what he was doing. Yeah. You know, I, he would, I mean, not that that would justify him, he'd get out of it, but can we do that? I'm sure we can. Because, I mean, I can't believe that David would say that right to him, knowing that he was the man, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. But I always wondered about that. I thought, man, that's kind of a scary situation. Yeah. To find yourself in. Oh, yeah. I think we, I think people do that very frequently. We're really good at justifying our sins. <laughs> really good at at finding reasons why it's okay for us to sin, <laughs> and it's not really sin because this circumstance, you know, means it's not sin. But. But he repented, and that was, 
you know, the Lord showed mercy to him. Uh, real quick, one thing. Um, I think I, I kind of hinted on it, but I just want to really kind of directly drive this home. Ruth was a Moabite. She was a stranger. She was uh, not worthy. You know, she... Uh, Boaz had every reason to cast her out, not want her, and yet Boaz found worth in her. That's, that's what... Well, that's what the book of Ruth says. And so, of course, relate that to Jesus. We had turned our backs on God. We were not a part of God anymore. We had rejected Him. We had turned from Him. We had no worth. We had no value. And yet, Jesus looked down on us and said, no, actually, you do have value. I see value in you, and I want you. you know, and I'm going to do what I can to redeem you. That's just a, a beautiful, just a beautiful picture of Jesus and His love for us. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm. You know, I don't know exactly how she knew exactly what to do. You know, you could argue that, well, the Lord was letting her know. You know, um, you know, as far as that, I mean, you know, I don't know how did how did Naomi know that Boaz would get drunk and pass out in the threshing floor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, timing is impeccable. I know. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I just, I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Give me something to. Seems like that's just something you know we all did. The harvest was a catch. Yeah. Full of it. Anybody else? All right, let's take a few minute break and prepare for soul food.